Hello, um, I'm delighted to welcome you to the first of our Nova Gene Genomic Research Live webinars. Uh, first off, apologies, we're starting a couple of minutes late, um, but a few Zoom issues going on in the background, but these things are sent to try us. So this is a brand new series that will feature some of the world's leading scientists discussing their latest research. The webinars will be broadcast to a global audience and will feature speakers from all corners of the world. So we start this series with guest speaker, Dr. Pierre Cordelia, who will be presenting his latest work. So a bit of housekeeping just before we start. The webinar will run for a total of one hour, so it'll go over by about 10 minutes. There'll be around 15 minutes for a question and answers at the end. Please submit your questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You can upvote a question by clicking the thumbs up symbol next to it. We'll try and prioritize the most popular questions. And don't forget, if we don't have time to answer your question, we will come back to you via email after the webinar. Uh, please don't use the raise hand functionality. Just send any questions via the Q&A or message us directly if you have a technical issue. We'll share the slide deck and a recording of the webinar via email. You can expect this on Friday, the latest. Uh, due to popular demand, we've added a webinar attendance certificate for any students on the webinar who require one. There'll be a link in the follow-up email to get a certificate that you can save or print. I'd now like to introduce Shitsi, who'll be your host for the webinar. Uh, Shitsi, over to you. Hello, everyone. Okay, let me just reset off my screen and then we're ready to go. Okay. Just bear with me for a second. So, and um, so, and good afternoon again, and really thank you for joining. So my name is Dr. Shi Qian from Novagen Europe. So this is a great pleasure on behalf of Novagen team to welcome you to our new global webinar series. And this is hosted under a genomics research life um, platform. And so this platform is an online platform, which is facilitated by Novagen and to provide a professional and dedicated online sharing experience for life science scientists around the globe. And this platform provides a forum for leaders from around the world in the scientific, clinical, and business space to showcase their advancement and progress in the field. So the COVID pandemic has led to significant changes in the way people work and communicate with each other. It is clear the um, virtual and the digital environment plays an even a greater role than previously ever envisaged. So under this um, unprecedented time, which have led to the development of a borderless scientific community whose only focus is to share knowledge and learn from one another. So this really aligns strongly with Novogen's mission to advance the field of genomics and through sharing knowledge and the cooperation. So today is our great privilege to introduce Dr. Pierre Cordelier from Toulouse Cancer Research Center in France, who will provide today's lecture. And Dr. Cordelier has been working in the field of gene therapy since early in his career, studying for a PhD in Toulouse before moving to Philadelphia for his postdoc and fellowship at Thomas Jefferson University. He has since spent over 15 years at the Toulouse Center and Research, Cancer Research Center, which is part of the INSERM. And this is a France a National Institute of Health and Medical Research where he actually fulfills his passion for improving the lives of patients with pancreatic cancer and through uh, viral-based gene transfer therapy. So today, Dr. Cordelier will speak about his work focused on addressing the new role of um, uh, citidine and deaminase in pancreatic cancer using uh, transcriptomics. Okay. So John already uh, went through the housekeeping. So please, I do encourage you to type in questions during the lecture. You don't have to wait in the end. And then we will have a very short survey uh, in the end of the, the, uh, the webinar. And we will have some time uh, in the end to discuss uh, with Dr. Kodalayer about um, uh, Q&A session. Okay, now let me um, hand over to this uh, to uh, Dr. Kodalayer. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you clearly. Excellent. Uh, I just have to apologize because I'm the cause of the, of the delay. <laughs> I had an issue with Zoom here in my, in my institution. So um, very, uh, thank you very much for the invitation and for the kind introduction. So um, 
um, I have no, um, I will not be able to, um, to, uh, to share the, the, the slides from my side. So can you please put them in, a, in, a, in full screen from your side, please? Excellent. All right, so uh, um, we're going to discuss about half an hour or and maybe a little more about a, an enzyme that has a very interesting uh, role in pancreatic cancer. Uh, and it's named citidine deaminase. So can you, next one, please? So uh, as, you, as you mentioned, I, I work in Toulouse in the south of France, it's a very nice place to live and to work um, within the, within the uh, Oncopole of Toulouse, which is a um, uh, combination of research labs of a, a clinic that is dedicated to cancer patients. And the, that's a very nice campus you can see on the, on the right here. Um, the, the beauty of this, of this site is that we are directly connected to the clinics, to the pathology department. So all the tumor samples are, are within the reach of, of hand. And um, we have a very active uh, clinical trial unit. And uh, a lot of those trials are coming from, from the research of the lab. And they are, uh, that's, a, as I said, it's a really nice uh, place to, to work. Um, so next slide, please. So I've been interested in, in, in addressing therapeutic resistance of pancreatic cancer for, for, for a long time now. And uh, for those of you, of you that may not know this disease, it's a very highly deadly disease. Uh, the problem with pancreatic cancer or PDAC, which is the acronym, uh, that is largely asymptomatic and usually diagnosed late. Uh, all the patients develop metastasis. So sometimes um, it's really hard to treat them. Uh, those tumors are very complex at the cellular and the, and the molecular level. And the conventional treatments have little to no impact on survival. So it's a it's planned to be the second cause of death by cancer uh, by uh, 2030. Um, so we've been working on the mechanism of resistance of pancreatic tumors to, uh, to therapy and with a focus on gemcitabine activity. Um, so since 1997, gemcitabine is one of the standard of care uh, as a first-line chemotherapy for patients that have, uh, that have pancreatic cancer. And uh, if we look at the pathway, uh, that gemcitabine, which is DFDC, it's a defluorated DC, DCTDN analog. Um, it has to enter the cell through, uh, through an ENT1. It has to be phosphorylated four times, three times, sorry, by three uh, kinases to, uh, to be in the uh, DCTP form and, and then incorporated into an uh, elongating DNA strain to induce uh, cancer cell death because it's a, it's a termination uh, uh, molecule. And we've been working on the looking at the, um, the expression of those enzymes that are that those kinases that are uh, important in the phosphorylation of of uh, the FDC of gemcitabine, uh, and we found that the two first one DCK here and NMPK are uh, down expressed in most of the pancreatic tissue that we were uh, able to analyze. Next slide, please. So this stemmed for a, um, uh, some preclinical work uh, where we, in, during which we, uh, we engrafted in the pancreas of, of mice human, human cancer cells and with uh, gene transfer to restore the expression of DCK and UMK with treatment with gemcitabine, we, we were able to reduce the size of the tumors. And it was also additionally uh, the, the associate R2 gene that has had broad anti tumoral activity. And all this work led to uh, two clinical trials. You have the description here, a phase one and a phase two that just terminated last year with the results uh, that, that were obtained. And we have some very interesting results in terms of uh, reduction of tumor size. Um, but that, that is a fact, it's now, um, it's now in the clinics, but in the lab, we are still working on how to improve the, uh, the efficacy of those treatments. And um, by this strategy I just showed you, we try to improve the activity of, of gemcitabine. Um, and then we look at the other way around, we're trying to uh, prevent the, the chemotherapy to be, uh, uh, let's say, detoxified by the cancer cells. Next slide, please. Thank you. So if we look at all the mechanisms that can um, go the other way around, meaning that they can inhibit the activity of, uh, of gemcitabine. You have uh, on the bottom left the uh, ribonucleotide reductase that, that can compensate for, uh, for CTPs. 
Uh, but on the top here, uh, right after the, uh, the, the chemotherapy has entered the, the cells, uh, citinin deaminase is doing a great job to, um, to deaminate actually uh, citidine into uridine. And then the FDU is extracted, uh, is uh, secreted from the cells and, uh, and the chemotherapy cannot work anymore. So this enzyme is quite interesting. Uh, it's, uh, it belongs to the pyrimidine salvage pathway uh, by, uh, let's say, recycling citidine to uridine. And when you look at the, this, uh, this protein in patients, um, the activity of, of CDA is, is predictive of gemcitabine toxicity in patients. Actually, it's, uh, it's something that can be monitored in the blood of patients. Um, many groups have, have found that in response to chemotherapy, CDA can be expressed uh, by, by cancer cells. So it's a, it's a resistance to, to treatment. Uh, acquired resistance to, to treatment. And uh, in many cancers, in, in, including pancreatic cancer, CDA expression is associated with resistance to citidine analogs. Uh, it's, also, it's also known for AML, for uh, leukemia. And, uh, but what we found is quite interesting is that CDA is specifically overexpressed in pancreatic tumors. Next slide, please. Thank you. So on the left, it's the result of the uh, RNA uh, detection, RNA-seq from our backup cohort. So backup uh, cohort is uh, one of the largest um, uh, clinical biological cohort for patients with pancreatic cancer. And we were able to find that in, when people got surgery uh, for, for, pan for pancreatic tumors, uh, the expression of CDA was uh, higher in the tumor uh, than in the normal tissue. If we go down to TCGA cohort, so it could be fine in the curated TCGA cohort too. If we split the samples into basal and classic, uh, basal have a, a very a worst, let's say a worse prognosis than classic. CDA again is overexpressed in those samples. And the recent paper by uh, Dreyer's lab um, looks like a CDA is also uh, elevated. Uh, that's the right part of the, of the of of the slide in squamous versus um, more classical uh, um, primary uh, cells derived from patients. So it looks like CDs are most of the time overexpressed in, in those tumors. Next slide, please. So um, uh, we devised a, um, a strategy to try to target uh, CDA expression in cancer cells, in, in cancer cell models with length interval vectors because we found that um, the expression of CDA was associated with a worse prognosis in those tumors. And this is using SHRNA uh, here on the top right. And we got pretty interesting results in, uh, in vitro and in vivo. So in vivo on the left, uh, in vitro on the left, so we, I showed you also the results of inhibitors of CDA. It's in the middle, sorry, <laughs> of CDA inhibitors. Uh, and uh, because we want to have long, long, long-lasting effect in vivo, we switched to for SHRNAs, as I said before. And on the right, you can see that the, the expression of uh, this SHRNA, so targeting uh, CD expression in combination with mcitabine, is clearly inhibiting tumor growth. And on the next slide, you will see a, a representative picture of mouse. That, uh, that, um, if you go next, please, sorry. Okay, so here you have the, on, on the left side, the two mouse got um, cancer cells with a control SHRNA. So you see that with, regardless of the gemcitabine treatment, the, the, the tumor is growing. And on the right, when you blunt CDA expression, the chemotherapy is not working anymore. So it's very promising results. But that's not exactly uh, the end of the story. Uh, if, you go, if you can go next, please. All right, so, um, Marion Geral, who, uh, who uh, performed her PhD a few years ago, uh, was keeping on telling me that she has something weird, that she had a very nice effect on the proliferation of the cells uh, when she was targeting CDA, but, not, um, but, but no need of gemcitabine. So it was quite interesting, and she repeated the data. And on the top left, you see that if you inhibit CDA, the cancer cell proliferation is going down. Um, uh, bottom left is uh, uh, colony formation assay. So the cells are not able to grow anymore. Uh, we validated those approach with other siRNAs or CRISPR approaches to make sure that we are not, we are not making mistakes. Cell death is going up, it's in the middle panel. 
and we have a, the usual uh, marker of uh, cell death by Western blotting and in vivo. Um, we perform other experiments showing that uh, inhibiting CDA itself without any uh, chemotherapy was enough to, uh, to reduce tumor growth. This is what is shown on the right panel. So it was very promising, arguing, arguing for um, a role of CDA by itself in palliative cancer. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so if we, go, if we look back at the, uh, uh, at the function of CDA, the regular function of CDA within a cell, it's a cartoon on the left, uh, you can see that this, uh, the activity of the protein is essential to refill the um, pyrimidine synthesis pathway that is uh, highly important for DNA synthesis, but also RNA synthesis. So we've been looking at a correlation in between these pathways and pathways that might be enriched uh, in a pancreatic tumor. So looking at the TCGA on the top right, that's the work of what I'm going to show you now, the work of Audrey Lumeau, uh, former PhD in the group, who is now a postdoctoral fellow in the Bots Institute in London. Um, and we saw that very interestingly that the, the tumors that were CDA high got a signature of DNA replication. And uh, that was quite interesting because it was mimicking what we would expect from, from, uh, from the known function of the enzyme. And to try to, um, to uh, make uh, functional assay on that, we, um, we, we took pancreatic cancer cells that, we, that have relatively low expression of CDA, and then we express the proteins on the, on, on the bottom of the, of the slide uh, with uh, lentiviral vectors, and they were transduced to express CDA. And when we perform RNA-seq, uh, actually with a Novogen, com Novogen company, we were able to um, mimic the uh, enrichment in the signature of DNA replication we found in the, in the tumors. So it looks like by that CDA expression by itself can induce a phenotype of highly DNA replicating cells. Uh, I should mention this is not due to the fact that the, the cells are, are growing better. It's not connected to cell cycle. Those, those cells uh, are replicating just like, the, just like the control cells, but they are specifically engaging a pathway of DNA replication when a CDA is expressed. So next slide, please. So we, we, uh, we perform a, um, a um, functional studies to uh, ask whether uh, CDA may increase replication fork speed and restart efficiency. So it's um, quite a common um, experiment to make where you use two um, um, pyrimidine analogs uh, and then you stretch DNA fibers and you go for immune staining. And you can see on the middle panel that when you have, um, when you add the, those uh, analogs in um, in cells that are overexpressing CDA, the DNA, fib DNA fibers are longer, and this is what is quantified on, on the right. And uh, and then on the, on the bottom, we we um, we added a uh, treatment by hydroxyuridine, which is supposed to block uh, replication uh, replication fork. And then uh, after. Um, Adding the second uh, the second uh, base analog, we were able to demonstrate that the fork uh, were restarting sooner and better uh, when the cells were uh, were expressing CD. Uh, next slide, please. Um, that's an interesting uh, finding. Um, but next uh, step we we took was to. Uh, to ask uh, whether CDA could um, directly and physically interact with, with the replication fork. And we first look at the, uh, the uh, distribution of CDA in, in a cell, it's in the left panel. And uh, we could find some, some evidence of uh, uh, CDA expression in the nucleus. Uh, it's supposed to be a cytosolic protein, but we have a hints of the detection of uh, CDA in the nucleus. And we have generated a, um, a um, CDA uh, flag with a with a, with a uh, with a HA uh, epitope to uh, with a CRISPR approach to look at the endogenous protein because unfortunately the um, the antibodies against CDA are not this um, easy to, uh, to to work with when doing immunofluorescence or immunostaining in a in a cell. 
And what we did next was to address whether a CD can interact directly with the replication fork. And this is on the, on the right panel. And we performed the I-pound uh, approach where you basically immunoprecipitate uh, the proteins that are um, interacting with uh, DNA, nascent DNA fibers. Um, and this is using EDU that is incorporated into the uh, nascent DNA fiber and strand. And uh, what we can see here on, on the, when you perform the Western bot of what is immunoprecipitated, in the presence of EDU, um, there is a, you can, you can immunoprecipitate MCM7, PCNA uh, on the left here, uh, and, uh, but also CDA flag. Um, that means that this, the, um, the protein CDA is um, adhering at some, uh, at some point or uh, located to the replication fork. And this was done with uh, Cyril Ribert in, in Montpellier. So, and when we used uh, a timidine chase uh, to uh, make the replication fork progress, um, the, we, um, we, we lost the, uh, the signal for CDA showing that the protein is, uh, is not stuck like an histone, let's say, uh, on the DNA, but it's progressing with the replication fork. So this is very interesting and something quite uh, remarkable for a protein uh, that is supposed to be cytosolic mainly. All right, so next slide, please. Oh, this, this is a quite busy slide. I'm sorry, I don't have the animation. But I will walk you through that. So on the top left, we, uh, we perform exactly the, um, the mirror experiment because we thought that if CDA could uh, induce DNA replication, probably that targeting this enzyme may induce replication stress. Uh, that's um, basic thinking, but it works actually. Uh, we repeated the same, exactly the same experiment of DNA spreading, but here we added a positive control, which is a treatment with aphidicline that is blocking the replication fork. Um, and um, what we see here is that um, down-regulating CDA expression in those cells has quite the same effect than treating with aphidicoline. So it's a huge sign of replication stress. And this is on the top left. If you go down to the uh, bottom left, uh, we perform RNA-seq from cells that were uh, expressing shRNAs against uh, CDA. And uh, this, is, this was done with the gene, by the way. And we could found, find that um, the, uh, the depletion of uh, CDA in those cells uh, was associated with an enrichment, uh, and the signature of replication stress. So this is something that is quite, uh, quite interesting too. And we, um, we found also that uh, check one phosphorylation was high in the in the cells that were uh, depleted for CDA here in the in the Western blot. Um, we next look at marks of a uh, DNA damage. Uh, this is on the top right. Um, so we perform uh, gamma H2AX staining, but also uh, 50 to BP1 uh, and RPA. So these are three markers that can um, tell you whether you have uh, replication stress in your cells. And it's easy to see that when you have uh, expression of an shRNA against CDA, but it's also true when using uh, chemicals that are inhibiting CDA, you induce a, number, a large number of gamma, gamma H2AX foci. Um, this is in S phase because we co-stain with EDU. So this is all marks of replication stress. And um, if if we do um, the mirror experiment, meaning that we are using cells that are overexpressing CDA, this is a, on the bottom right uh, panel, uh, you see that you are uh, down regulating the number of, of foci when expressing the enzyme. And what is quite interesting is that we engineered a deaminase deficient CDA mutant, and there is no effect anymore. So it, it, it means that. Uh, the, uh, the effect of CDA on the downregulation of replication stress in pancreatic cancer is completely um, due to its deaminase activity. So it's um, filling the gap in between the action of CDA in the pyrimidine pathway and the activity on the, on the DNA elongation in those cells. Um, next slide, please. 
So we went further in the uh, mechanistics uh, of this effect. And uh, this is in French, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, and we look for uh, markers of genomic instability in pancreatic cancer. So it's in the top left here. Uh, if you have uh, incomplete replication, DNA replication in S phase, you will induce um, um, fine bridge, DNA fine bridge, uh, ultra fine bridge of DNA, UFBs, during mitosis, during anaphase. And uh, if it's not repaired, it can, link, it can link to macronucleus formation, meaning that you have a, a bit of uh, genomic information that is uh, ejected from the, the pack of chromosomes. Um, so on the bottom left, we, uh, we, uh, we addressed the formation of U UFBs by staining with FANG-D2, that is um, located at both sides of the, of, the, uh, um, of the fragile site. Uh, again, when we uh, downregulate CDA, which is with the blue uh, cells, let's say, uh, the FANG-D2 uh, um, foci uh, in early mitosis are going up as compared to control. And on the other way, when we overexpress CDA, uh, that's the red cells, this number is going down. So it looks like uh, CDA also controls genomic instability. And speaking of those micronucleus, it's on the right here. Um, you can see them, there are small spots, small white spots uh, when exactly, <laughs> thank you, uh, when staining with DAPI, they are outside the nucleus. Uh, um, and, um, and exactly, thank you. And when you, when you count those um, micronuclei, uh, they are going up uh, when we are inhibiting CD expression. And uh, on the right, they are going down when we are overexpressing CDA. And once again, the expression of a catalytically inactive mutant of the enzyme is doing nothing, showing that everything is due to the deaminase function of the year. Exactly. Thank you. Um, next slide, please. All right. So this is something um, that is quite interesting is in case that you don't have any DNA repair, uh, so, so to have micronucleus formation, um, you can have some scars, let's say, within DNA in the next generation. And um, those DNA damages can be uh, transmitted to daughter cells. And, uh, and this is visualized by 50, 50 p one bodies in J1 phase. Um, and here, um, this is an, uh, um, an, an immunofluorescence for, uh, for 53 bp one And you see that uh, the number of those foci, of those bodies, because it's bigger than four size, are increased in cells that are um, targeted with, uh, that are treated with SHRNAs uh, against CDA. Again, a, another um, indicator of uh, genetic stress induced by the, uh, by the targeting of the enzyme. Okay, so next please. All right, so um, most of the time we mainly focus on cells, uh, on DNA synthesis during mitosis during, sorry, during S phase. But in uh, some serious cases, and this is uh, the, schema, the schema on the left, you, you, uh, you can have DNA replication in early mitosis. And this is called MIDAS. And this is something that is quite particular because uh, this, the cells can, uh, can induce this type of uh, DNA synthesis. And this is an emergency way of uh, synth synthesiz synthesizing DNA. And it's non unchecked. So, meaning that uh, this, the error rate is very high. And uh, so, we, we look at this, um, at this mechanism in the cells that are um, treated or not with, with uh, inhibitors of CDA. And we focus on cells at the uh, G2M uh, interface. And you can see on the top right here that when you block cells and then you you induce some uh, some fork uh, fork uh, inhibition. You have a foci of Fang D two, meaning that um, there is a the, there is unreplicated DNA um, DNA regions. And when you add EDU to stain the um, the DNA synthesis in those regions, you can see that CDA is is uh, increasing um, the number of uh, of uh, forks um, and of, of DNA damage of single strand DNA that is synthesized. So it means that there is MIDAS going on here. And this is what is graphed uh, on the bottom. And again, 
when you go, uh, when you express CDA, you're increasing late DNA synthesis. And when you target CDA, you're decreasing late DNA synthesis. So probably that CDA is acting at two steps during cell cycle uh, to decrease replication stress, at least endogenous replication stress during S phase, as we've seen before, and now uh, in, uh, during mitosis to try to, um, to uh, replicate the DNA that has not been replicated yet. All right, so next, please. Um, we've tried to get back to tumors uh, with these new findings in hand. Uh, and uh, we, we performed the same set of analysis with data from the TCGA. And um, we found that um, the tumors that were CDA high uh, have this signature of uh, ATR response uh, to replication stress. So this is uh, mimicking what we found in, 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 cell mo in cellular models. And also a very strong enrichment of the SINSARC signature. Uh, SINSARC is a signature that has been described to be uh, highly connected to aggressivity of tumors, but also to, uh, to genetic instability. And we've made this analysis of uh, aneuploidy score and non-silent mutation per megabase uh, to address the tumor load of those tumors. And this is quite interesting because we see that tumors that have high CDA can support more genetic, uh, let's say, uh, instability than tumors that have low CDA. This is blue uh, versus red. And this is not found with DHODH. -DH. Um, this is pink, uh, sorry, green and, and beige. Uh, DSODH is the main enzyme of the uh, de novo pyrimidine synthesis. So this is specific to the recycling pathway of, uh, pyrimidine, of pyrimidines. This is uh, not true with BRCA, BRCA, uh, but, all, but this is true for PolQ. PolQ is, is, a, is, is a, a polymerase with a mutator phenotype. So this is sort of a positive control. And um, so we can as we can tell here, is that those tumors that have more CDA can support more genetic instability than the others. That's why maybe they are more aggressive. And so the model is the following. Um, you know that tumors need genomic instability for the growth, it's in the top panel. And, um, but if too much is too much by definition, so they can die uh, of too much genetic instability. And um, we, though they need to reach an optimal level uh, to acquire mutations that will be selected, but also um, mutation that will help them resist against treatment. And uh, on the bottom panel, uh, drugs that are now used in, in clinics and that are targeting DNA synthesis are trying to push this level of instability to levels that cannot be handled anymore by the tumor cells. And so they die. And we thought that maybe CDA was important to address, to, to allow a certain level of mutation load for the tumor to propagate, but also for the tumors to resist to treatment, regardless of the known activity on chemotherapy. So we look at other therapies than gemcitabine in the cancer cell line encyclopedia, the CCME. And we made correlation studies, and we found that CD expression was associated in those cell lines with resistance to the main current uh, and common drugs used in tumors, especially in pancreatic cancer. Oxaliplatin, irinotecan, cisplatin, Temolozomide, it's something different, but also mitoxantron have been used in the past. All of them are targeting DNA synthesis and the cells with high CD levels are more resisting to those drugs than those that are low level of CD. So next, please. All right, so again, quite busy uh, slide. Sorry about that. Uh, so we, uh, we've made this, we made this assumption that um, cells with high CD expression might better resist um, treatment with drugs uh, targeting uh, DNA synthesis so that they can handle better replication stress. 
And uh, so we, we, we did some preliminary experiments with cell lines, of course, and then with the collaboration of Nelson Musetti in Marseille, we uh, addressed uh, the proliferation and the resistance of treatment of primary cultures from patients. It's in the top left. Um, and, um, and we see that by itself, CDA can strongly inhibit cell proliferation. Uh, we were using uh, siRNAs this time. And then we treated those uh, cells with oxalitatin that induces replicative, replicative stress. Sorry, we, we validated that, but it's also true for camptotensin. And we were able to completely shut down cell proliferation by combining uh, and targeting of CDA using siRNAs and oxaliplatin. And so we, um, we made in vivo uh, experiments, it's on the, on the bottom, on the, sorry, on the, on the right panel. Where in which we, for which we engrafted uh, primary human pancreatic cancer cells in the pancreas of athenic mice, and we perform intratumoral siRNA delivery, and then um, treatment with oxaliplatin. So the graph on the left shows the tumor progression um, you, uh, with um, either the control siRNA or CDA siRNA. There is no difference to start with. But uh, 10 days after treatment, you can see that the tumors are much less progressive when they receive both siRNA and oxaliplatin as compared to, to, um, to controls. And if you go to the next slide, again, we, have, we performed RNA-seq uh, with Novogene on those tumors. And we could find that in the tumors that were treated by siRNA against CDA and oxaliplatin, we had a strong and significant enrichment in the, in the signature of P53 signaling pathway with induction of ATR, check one and check two, but also uh, some hints of increase of DNA's polymerase activity. This is very common because we know that cells try to escape by uh, in increasing their replication. So it is a secondary target but also homologous recombination uh, with increase in BRCA1 and 2 activity. Uh, this is quite interesting because you may know now that patients with high replication stress induced by um, fulforinox, which contains oxaliplatin, are eligible to Olapari treatment that targets BRCA1. So this is one thing that we may try in the next future. And um, if you can go next, we perform also single cell RNA-seq analysis so first to confirm that CDA expression was down in those, in those tumors. And then um, we got uh, the same result, but with higher numbers, of course, as a single cell, uh, with pyrimidine metabolism going down, DNA replication going down, and uh, on the contrary, aberrant regulation of J1 transition going up when cells were treated by siRNA targeting CDA and oxaliplatin. Okay, um, so next, this is to, to wrap up and to, to summarize um, this, um, this work. It is now, um, uh, this is posted in BioArchive if, if you want to have more details. And Audrey Lumeau is the first author. So um, we can now consider with this work that CDA by itself is a protein of interest in pancreatic cancer biology. Uh, but we don't still know the role of CDA uh, during uh, pancreatic, uh, pancreatic cancer oncogenesis. We don't know if, it's, uh, if CDA is uh, uh, induced early or late. And if, for instance, using animal models to, um, uh, to blunt CDA expression may prevent uh, cancer growth. We don't know that. And um, we, we still don't know neither the molecular mechanisms that are involved in CDA expression induction in pancreatic cancer. So this is something very interesting to address. Uh, I've shown you uh, only the, uh, the, the role on the DNA replication, but we are now investigating other oncogenic pathways uh, that, that need uh, CDA, uh, CDA for, for functioning and for, prevent, you know, for promoting uh, pancreatic cancer cell growth. So uh, CDA oncogenic action is quite complex, and we found that it involves dependent, just like we shown, or independent, this is a work in progress, uh, DMNA functions. Uh, meaning that CDA can, can be uh, a, 
an integrator or can partner with other proteins and we have performed a, a CDA interactome that is now analyzed to, uh, to address a CDA, uh, um, let's say, uh, uh, proteins uh, that might be involved in, in the um, uh, proliferation of cancer cells. And so the, the conclusion is that targeting CDA may, uh, may obviously offer some hope in um, sensitizing tumor cells to gemcitabine, but now we can extend that to drugs that are targeting DNA. Uh, and the result here will be uh, inhibition of tumor growth and invasion. Um, I've talked a, a briefly of CDA inhibitors, uh, dihydrouridine, DHQ, and uh, diazepinone riboside, DR. Um, there is a lot of work uh, on the tetrahydrouridine, sorry, uh, THU. Um, they, they are working, but I think we can do better. And there are groups in the world that are trying to make them better for patients, but there are, there've been some clinical trials that, that showed that they were not this efficient. And in the lab, we are trying to address uh, targeting of CDA expression by different ways. And one way is to devise the novel nanobodies uh, for the intracellular targeting of this enzyme. All right, so I will finish with the um, last slide, uh, thanking you for your attention. And the picture of the group, um, really fortunate to lead in, in Toulouse, and the collaborators within the CRCT, Vera Pancaldi and Miguel madrid Mencia were instrumental to, uh, to analyze the results, and our friends and colleagues in, in Marseille and Montpellier. Paris and the support by, uh, by the different foundations and, and INSA. And uh, we thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, um, Dr. Um, Kudlayer. Uh, so um, that was a very uh, interesting presentation and uh, a lot of uh, advancement in the field. So we do get a few questions from our uh, audience. Okay, so uh, let me just uh, find uh, a few for you. Okay, so and if there's more questions, please feel free to, to type into the Q&A, okay? And so the first questions come from uh, uh, Daniel. So he wants to ask you, or she wants to ask you about how does the tumor cells survive without a phosphorylating enzymes that you told us uh, appear underexpressed at the beginning? Okay, so you mean DCK and you mean you UMDCK probably? Um, I mean this is a this is not black and white situation. This is difference in, in level of expression, um, and for sure that um, I know apparently cancer cells are very plastic and they always find the best level of expression they need for grow for growing. And uh, what we found is that as compared to normal tissue or other tissues, those two enzymes expression was down uh, as compared to, uh, to what we would expect. Um, I think they, they, they made their way to survive because they are, these, these, these proteins uh, are essential for tumor growth because they are part of the pyrimidine uh, pathway. What we did with the gene therapy clinical trial is that we forced, actually, we, we pushed the pedal. We increased the expression. And by increasing the expression, we increased the, the uh, the metabolism of a gemcitabine, basically. And um, this is just like a suicide gene, but here with natural proteins and, uh, and, and chemical drugs. Actually. Okay, thank you very much. That's a good so, question. Thank you. Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> it's a good answer as well. Okay. And, and then the next question is about as the function of CDA specific for um, the tumor cells um, only. So it's um, basically, so actually I have similar questions that I want to ask as well. Uh, so this protein seems to be really, really important. I can you know imagine it's quite important uh, in, in general and probably you know it has an impact on, on other uh, pathways as well as just mentioned. Yes. Uh, by using those targeted, you know, um, um, uh, gene therapy or inhibitors, you know, will that have an impact on other cells? And also, can this apply to other type of cancer as well? That's that's a great question. We are trying. We are always trying to expand <laughs> um, the, the tumors we can treat with a single agent. Um, just to to um, to answer the first question, um, is there basically is there a risk of targeting CDA in a normal human being? 
um, a CDA is a ubiquitary express, but not at the same level. They are very different levels. You have a lot of CD expression in myeloid cells, for sure. And this is why you can induce resistance by the microenvironment, by the way. It's quite interesting. But usually in normal cells, uh, uh, most of the work is done by the de novo pyrimidine pathway, the DHODH. So we can consider CDA as a um, synthetic lethality opportunity. Why this is important in pancreatic cancer cells? Uh, you know, those tumors are, I mean, they can recycle everything. I have friends that, that, that have been showing that they can even degrade the matrix to get uh, nutrients to feed their own growth. So those, those cells are amazingly plastic and probably they, um, they, they recycle the, all the nucleotides they have in, inside the cells uh, before trying to make new biomass. So this is why it's very interesting for us to try to target CDA in those tumors. And to extend to other cancer type, we know that leukemic myeloid um, um, AML, acute myeloid leukemia, sorry, uh, they express high level of CDA sometimes. And this is a, a response factor, a prognostic factor of response um, against Citarabine, which is also um, the OCCTD analog. And there are some types of uh, lung cancer that can be treated with lincitabine, and those lung tumors have high CDA expression too. So this is something we can extend. I don't know how uh, will we be able to target CDA in all those organs, so, to be honest, but, uh, but at least uh, there is more, more than pancreatic cancer that can benefit from uh, targeting this enzyme. And of course, yes, uh, CDA is involved in gemcitabine recycling, if I can say so, DNA synthesis, and we found other pathways that I cannot talk about today because it's still in, in process of the manuscript submission, but there are other pathways that are, that are, let's say, regulated by CDA expression and not due to the deaminase function, which is quite very interesting to, to study, actually. Okay, hey, thank you very much. Um, so here is uh, another question. Um, so um, this seems to be a really remarkable regulatory system. And it's, and you mentioned a lot of approaches and, you know, and this could be a really good target for anti-cancer therapy. Is there any, or, or have you have, do you have any plans uh, for preclinical or, or, or early, you know, phase one or phase two trials on this? And uh, how do you, you know, envisage this could be translated into real, like human treatment? And so. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> the $1 million question, yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, um, again, to be honest, at first we were we were planning to combine uh, increased expression of DCK and UMPCK as uh, as we have done in the first two clinical trials with targeting of CDA. Honestly, it's going to be complicated at some point. <laughs> uh, so there are different options. Um, the first one will be let's do what we know how to do. Uh, let's go for I don't know um, ways of targeting CDA expression. I've talked about nanobodies. This is something that I really, really like because the expression is kind of flash expression. It can be uh, transferred with RNA, just like vaccines. <laughs> we heard about a lot recently. Mm -hmm. uh, but the second option is to better, uh, to better understand the interactome of CDA. Because if we know with which protein CDA is, a, is, a, um, is interacting to address these oncogenic functions, maybe we can try to break those interactions, or maybe use uh, inhibitors that are known to work with um, possible partners of CDA. And last, um, even, even if we don't think about targeting all the time, we can you know, rely on CDA expression to ask whether a tumor will be responding or not to a treatment. And this is something we can do easily because RNA expression of CDA is, um, um, is indicative of CD action. So we used to sample uh, biopsies from pancreatic cancer patients. So maybe one day, if we have a tumor that is very uh, high in CDA, uh, we'll be very careful giving too many drugs targeting DNA. But on the, on the contrary, if those tumors are uh, low in CDA, that might be a good way trying to, um, to treat those patients. I mean, we can, 
who can use this information at the level of the expression of the protein or the RNA encoding for the protein, or either trying to um, devise novel, way, novel, uh, novel ways of targeting this um, protein in tumors. But it's, I mean, 50 50. <laughs> <Let's see. laughs> mm, yeah. Okay. So now I'm going to uh, change my line of questions a little bit. Okay. So, um, like, let's look at the big picture just in the cancer research field or gene therapy field. So, what in your mind? What do you think are the key questions need to be addressed in this area? And what do you think, how do you feel, you know, genomics or sequencing technologies can do to facilitate to address those key questions? Well, this is easy. Two words. Precision <laughs> medicine. <laughs> I mean, you, you have to know, uh, mm -hmm. you have to know what you combat, basically. Um, and uh, I, you know, I, I started, I started working on pancreatic cancer 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, by this time, uh, clinicians were talking about pancreatic cancer at, as as once. You know what I mean? Now, with sequencing technology, I mean, I mean genomics, transcriptomics, and now single cell omics, of course, but more complicated to uh, understand and to analyze. Anyway, <laughs> uh, you have a better picture of what's going on. And for pancreatic cancer, is mandatory to do so because you have as much as pancreatic cancer, as much as you have patients. They are all different. They are all different. If you talk to a pathologist, he or she will tell you that there is, no, there is not one pancreatic cancer. There are several types of pancreatic cancer. So this is very important if you want to go down into the phenotype, into the genotype of the tumors in the patient to have the best knowledge you, you can have so maybe one day to look for CD expression to try to treat a patient the best way. This is, this is my belief. I mean, we, we move from, I mean, uh, one tumor to many different types of tumor. It's just like uh, colon cancer. Uh, 10 years ago, there was only one colon cancer. Now they got six or seven different subtypes and they have dedicated um, therapies for any of, uh, any of these subtypes. We are not still there for pancreatic cancer, it's really complicated. But I, I, I think that, I believe that you need to know what, what is inside the tumor. You, know, you need to know what are the pathways that are, that are engaged in, a, uh, induced in, in this tumor if you, want, if you want, if you try to defeat it. We are moving slowly but surely um, in this way. And I hope that I'm not the only one thinking that, of course, but better knowledge of those tumors, deeper knowledge will help us classify and treat better. That's for sure. Thank you very much. That's a very comprehensive answer. So before we finish today's uh, uh, webinar, just one more last question for you. And uh, so you mentioned briefly your, his, your you know, uh, career development and uh, the, the, the journey in the cancer field. So just want to know a little bit more, you know, what is uh, your inspiration to follow this line of research? And if you have any advice for upcoming scientists as well. <laughs> Resilience, curiosity. <laughs> no, but, and uh, you know, the people you meet for sure, they will drive you one way or the other. Uh, you will have, uh, let's say, Good people, bad people. I have more good people than bad people in my career, for sure. Uh, but I mean, if you want to make a difference, um, work hard, be curious. Um, if you stumble, you fall, you raise. And uh, this is the, I mean, this is a credo of all the scientists, I think. And um, being in a place like Toulouse, where we have some sort of comprehensive cancer center, uh, when you can accelerate, discoveries into clinical application is very, very, I mean, it's something that is driving my, my days actually. <laughs> so, I mean, the best place, you have to be at the best place at, at the best time. This is something that is not going, probably during the first step of your careers, but then when you have the choice, you can make the right choice. 
thank you very much. So unfortunately, we have run out of time uh, today. Thank you again, Dr. Kudlayer, uh, for the amazing talk, and I really appreciate your time and the support. And I also like to thank all the audience today for attending, and I really hope you enjoyed the talk and the discussion with Dr. Kudlayer. And, uh, and just a little bit at the end. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, for all the attendees, you will receive an email links with the, the webinar recordings and slides back. Uh, and also, uh, when you leave the webinar, there will be a really short survey for popping your browser. I would like to uh, take a couple minutes to complete this. This will really help us uh, to plan our future webinars. And if you have any further questions, please feel free to reach out. And we're really looking forward to see you in our next webinar and uh, uh, enjoy off the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.